A couple had been married for 50 years. Things have really changed, the wife said. You used to sit very close to me. Well, I can remedy that, said the husband, moving over next to her on the couch. And you used to hold me tight. How's that, he said, as he gave her a big hug. Do you remember how you used to nudge my neck and nibble on my earlobes? He jumped to his feet and left the room. Where are you going, she said. I'll be right back, he said. I got to go get my teeth. (laughs) Things change with time, don't they? It seems like just yesterday I was holding my little boy in my arms. And now he's going to high school next year. Hard to believe. Things change with time. Sometimes that change is good. Sometimes it's not. Today we take a look at a change that Jesus talked about. Let's pray as we continue. Father in heaven, thank you for your presence here with us this morning. We pray that you will speak to our hearts and minds from your word, that you will draw us closer to yourself. Thank you in advance for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you this morning to take out your Bibles with me and open to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. In the opening chapter of Mark, he tells us about the forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist. He proceeds to tell us about Jesus' baptism, his uh, temptation in the wilderness. He begins to tell us about some of the um, miraculous workings of Jesus. Um, He talks about the demon being cast out of the man in the synagogue. He tells us about a cleansed leper and a paralytic who was healed. With each miracle, Jesus drew the attention of the religious leaders, but not in a good way. You see, Jesus was doing things that just weren't done. He was physically healing people, even forgiving their sins. The religious leaders did not take kindly to these actions. You would think that bringing people health and relief from sin and guilt would be a good thing, wouldn't you? I mean, who wouldn't be in favor of that? But the religious leaders weren't happy because Jesus was doing the things that they should have been doing. What was more, Jesus claimed to have power from God who he claimed was his father. And the religious leaders could not accept this. It was too much. Mark tells us next that Jesus went and called Matthew, the tax collector, to come and follow him. What was even worse, Jesus went to Matthew's house and ate a meal with tax collectors and sinners. Now, you may not like the IRS, but you might go out to dinner with a friend who works for the IRS. But the, the Pharisees wanted nothing to do with tax collectors because they worked for the hated Romans. In fact, not only did they work for the Romans, but they cheated their own people out of their money. Tax collectors were bad news. They were hated by the Jews. On another occasion, the religious leaders chided Jesus because his disciples didn't fast. Jesus responded to this accusation, chapter 2, verse 19. Mark chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus said to these accusations, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Jesus says when a wedding party is happening, there's no time to fast. It is time to celebrate. And we can relate, right? What wedding have you been to after all that didn't have some refreshments? Or at least a cake? And how many of you fasted over Thanksgiving? (laughs) No. You did? No. (laughs) No. No, we ate, we celebrated. It was a time of thanksgiving and celebration with family and friends. You don't fast when there's a celebration. Jesus said, no, my disciples aren't fasting. The bridegroom is here. Now, do we have a reason to celebrate together today? I'm not sure. (laughs) Do we have a reason to celebrate today? Yes, yes, we do. Jesus is here. We have great reason to celebrate. We have religious freedom, as our offering today goes to support. We have much to celebrate. Last Sabbath, we celebrated for a long time, because the pastor was a little long-winded. 
And we heard of all the great things that God is doing. We have much to celebrate. Are we fasting? No way. It is time for celebration. But Jesus goes on and continues in verse 20. But the days will come, he says, when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He said difficult days were coming, days of sadness and grief, and then plenty of fasting would take place. And there certainly were very sad days that followed Jesus' words, weren't there? When Jesus was crucified on a cross. Think of that Friday afternoon. Think of that Sabbath, a day that they were to celebrate what God had done, and yet Jesus was dead in the grave. There was not celebrating. And I imagine there may have been a loss of appetite. After the breakup of a marriage or the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, there is deep sadness. There's no celebration, and I dare say, a loss of appetite. And the same is true for us. God is good. He provides for us. We are in a time of rejoicing, but there's a time coming when we will struggle when we will deal with loss, where we will face tremendous difficulty. But that time is not yet. We have much to celebrate. Jesus then goes on and uses another illustration, one that at surface seems to be very much out of place. He goes on and says in verse 21, No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. Now, this may not make any sense to you, but I know we have some seamstresses here in our congregation, and you understand the illustration perfectly. You see, when you put a piece of new cloth, one that is unshrunk and unprepared to be used, onto an old garment that is well used and stretched, that new piece then begins to shrink, and it makes that tear that was there even worse. The condition of that new garment will be worse than before it was sewn together. Jesus then goes on and uses another illustration in verse 22. He says, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but the new wine must be put into new wineskins. This is a little odd, right? I mean, how many of you drank from a wineskin this last week? (laughs) I don't think so. Because you see, a wineskin was an animal's hide. They would kill the animal, they would gut it, they would take all the innards out, they're left with the skin, and they would take the legs and sew them together. And then where the neck of the animal was, that's where you drank from. Ew, that's kind of gross, right? <laughs> I'm glad we have glass bottles today. How about you? <laughs> But this in Jesus' day, this is how they kept the juice. They would put it in a wineskin. Now, the new wine was grape juice that had not begun or completed the fermentation process. Okay, you know, you make some concentrated grape juice. Worse yet, you get fresh grape juice and you leave it on the counter. What happens? Well, if it's in a plastic bottle, that plastic bottle after a couple days begins to expand. That juice is going through that fermentation process. And these wineskins, um, if new wine was put in them, the new wineskins would stretch as that process would begin. But if they poured that new wine, that new juice, that fresh juice into an old wineskin, that skin would burst as the fermentation process took place because the old wineskin was rigid and non-flexible. It was like putting that juice in a glass jar with a nice lid on top. And it would blow the lid off, shatter the jar. Putting new wine in an old wineskin was foolishness. The juice would destroy both the wineskin and the wine. No one wanted this waste. It would be absolutely foolish. And Jesus makes some very strong points with these two seeming uh, out-of-place illustrations. First of all, the old garment, the old wineskins, both represented Judaism. 
the religious leaders, this system that the people maintained. The ceremonies and practices of the Jews had become meaningless tradition. They were old and brittle. They were just what people did. And why did the people do them? Because they were supposed to. They lived by the letter of the law, not understanding what it was really there for. It was just the do's and don'ts. Do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And so they didn't, not understanding why. The new cloth and the new wineskin that Jesus used represented the ministry and teachings of Jesus. They were fresh. They were new. They would, they would grow. They were full of life and health, rejuvenation, both for the physical body of those that Jesus ministered to, as well as the spiritual person. Jesus' teachings and practice did not line up with the ancient rituals of the Jews. Jesus' teachings grew in popularity. Jesus had a following when brought into contact with the lifeless, calloused practices of Judaism. There was a stark difference. This collision of practices was bound to impact both the Jewish way of practice and the principles that Jesus brought to introduce. And in just one generation, the Jews were overthrown by the Romans. Christians were persecuted relentlessly, and finally Christianity accepted pagan rituals with time. So what do we make of the teachings of Jesus today? How, does the, how do these illustrations impact us today? Do we do anything today that is a meaningless form? Do we have traditions that are just traditions? Are we willing to let go of what was, those old brittle ways, to receive what God wants to be? Have we done church in a certain way for so long and gotten so comfortable that we're unwilling to change, to stretch, to be flexible? Are the things we do pointless tradition? Or have we just lost the meaning? Are we willing to change our service to accommodate a larger church family? Are we ready for three, four church services? Maybe more as people continue to fall in love with Jesus. Are we willing to part with a building that for some you've grown up in? For a building that will accommodate a larger church family. Are we willing to sacrifice our discomfort to see hundreds of people accept Jesus and fall into a loving relationship with Him? Are we ready to love on those who don't look like us, who don't talk like us, who don't eat like us? Are we ready to walk with them as they grow in their relationship with Jesus? Are we ready to let the Holy Spirit work in us to do things we never thought possible? preaching to hundreds of people the love of Jesus, working miracles in His name through faith, seeing lives forever changed. Are we okay with change? Are we ready to see God do miraculous things in our lives? As we look at the world around us, we can see it's falling apart, can't we? We see it everywhere. This is an election year, and, and it's probably going to be a little tumultuous, don't you think? As we look at the economy of the world around us, the economy is teetering. As we look at the nations around the world, it seems that the world continues to erupt in war, natural disasters. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled before our eyes. And it could bring a lot of fear to our hearts. Maybe some of you here this morning are full of fear. Maybe that's what brought you to church because you wanted some hope. <laughs> you wanted something to help dispel the fear that's in your heart. Well, fortunately, God tells us many things that bring us peace. One of the promises that he gives is in 1 John 4, verse 4, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Jesus is more powerful than any other force. He's bigger than your fear. And when you're fearful with the things you see around you, you can come to Jesus. And he can give you peace that you will find nowhere else. We have nothing to fear except our unwillingness to change, our unwillingness to follow Jesus, our unwillingness to become new wineskins. Friends, I want to invite you 
to change, to be new wineskins, to allow God to work in you this year as he never has before, to be willing to stretch and change, to do the things that God is calling you to. Maybe you, like I, have felt like we're on the edge of a precipice. You can feel as though great things are about to happen and you have this internal struggle. Am I willing to go into the unknown? Am I willing to change? Am I willing to do what God wants to do that I can't even imagine yet? Or am I too comfortable where I'm at? Going to church, sitting in my pew, going home and taking my nap. Am I too comfortable being an old wineskin or am I willing to become what God wants me to be? Jesus said you don't take a new piece of fabric and put on a broken piece of fabric. You don't take an old wineskin and fill with new wine. I want to be a new wineskin. I want to be flexible to do whatever it is that God is calling me to do, and I hope that that is your prayer as well. Because you see, if we're just content to stay where we are, to do what we've always done, we're going to burst. And it's going to be a tremendous loss. Jesus wants to do something new with you this year. He wants to stretch you. He wants to do his good work in you. Are you willing to be used by him? Are you willing to stretch? Are you willing to change? Are you willing to give everything to him? I want to challenge you to allow God to work in you this year as never has been before. That you'll stretch, that you'll be uncomfortable in 2024. I want to invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to come into your heart and that you will then Follow what he calls you to do. Because we can ask him to come in. And then when we're asked to do something new, no, 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 I'm not ready for that. No, I don't want to do that. We just push him right back out. But I want to invite you to ask him to come in and then do what he's asking you to do. You know, last Sabbath, I, I had a goal for our church family that I shared with you. And you know, it's dangerous as a leader to come to a, a body and say, hey, here's the goals for next year, because what input did you have? The pastor said, hey, this is what we're going to do. But one of the goals that I set out for our church this year is that we have 30 Bible studies. Now, that seems like a really small number for a church of 500 members, right? 30, that's pretty measly. But I'm not sure that we did that last year or the year before or the year before that. And so I set it out as a goal again this year, 30 baptism, or 30, 30 Bible studies, not even baptism, 30 Bible studies. And this last week I heard about six Bible studies that are beginning. Praise God, the first week of the year, six Bible studies already, praise God. I think 30 was too small a number because I think God wants to do something amazing, something miraculous in your life and mine. I think he wants to turn our church upside down. I think he wants to fill these pews so full that we have to go to three, four, maybe even five services. I don't know what God wants, but he wants far more than I can imagine. And far too often we think in human terms. Oh man, 30 Bible studies. I don't know if we can do that. Shame on me. God wants to do more than we can imagine. He wants to do something new. He wants to stretch us this year. And I believe that with all my heart. God is wanting to do something amazing. Are you willing? Are you willing to let him do that in your life? Because he's not going to do anything in your life without your willingness. So you're ready to stretch and be blessed? Or are you going to stay callous and be left behind? What are you going to do in 2024? I want to invite each one of you to experience miracles, the miracles that God wants to do in your life this year. Don't say no. Don't even say wait. Don't even say wait until tomorrow, Lord. No, do it now. When he calls, 
act, even if it doesn't make sense to turn down the road to go this direction, (laughs) even if it doesn't make sense to get that extra gallon of milk at the grocery store. Whatever he's calling you to do, do it. Because you see, God works in ways that we don't understand. But he always works it out for his glory. 